Well, good morning, New Creation. Good morning. Welcome to this November 13th, 2022. This is our first men's day since COVID-19, so. Thank you everybody for coming. Today we uh, celebrate God's life in, in our men's life here at New Creation United Methodist Church. The ministry of men is in the local church is defined as a core group of men partnering with their pastor to invite and initiate spiritual growth opportunities for all men in the church. Everyone has different gifts, graces, and areas of interest. Therefore, opportunities for participation would include diverse ministries of the church. The focus is not on participation. The, the focus is not on inward, inwardly, but on, oh, let me go back, so, sorry. <laughs> Therefore, opportunities for participation would include diverse ministries of the church. The focus is not inward, concentrating not only on those who attend a set meeting, but outward to all men, assisting them to engage the process of spiritual growth. And that's, that's our mission, to support spiritual growth among men, helping men to mature as disciples as, and to encourage spiritual formation in others. We declare the centrality of Christ in every man's life, promote the spiritual growth for, of men through effective discipleship, and we model the servant leadership of Christ in our daily lives. And how do we do this? We practice this by donating to our families in need. We do local repairs and fundraisers for the church here. We do maintenance and buy equipment for the church. We donate to the Good Samaritan program. And we sponsor events like the uh, Gospel Jamboree. We do fundraisers that build brothership. Uh, Y'all probably recognize the breakfast we used to do and, and we, sort of uh, took that to a, a dinner a few years ago, a spaghetti dinner. And Scotty, one of our members, uh, also sponsors a, a, a pool party for the church. And the theme of today's Men's Day is men making the world a safer and better place to live. And we thank Bishop Dr. Kenneth Monroe for being our speaker today. Okay. We go ahead to announcements. Today is also Veterans Day. I mean, well, Friday is Veterans Day. We like to lift up Rufus Fritch, Tyrone McClory, Torrance Porter, Charles Scott, Arthur Schuler. Larry Swinton, Betty Dennis, April Lopez, Zachary Baker, Lee Livingston, and Wilford Perry. Those are the names we have. If there's any others, please let us know so we can add them to the list. Adult Sunday School is every day, every Sunday at 2 p.m. Please join us. Next slide. We've started a prayer group, and Barbara Logan can speak to this. Uh, our next meeting will be on the 17th of November at 10 a.m. in the morning. It's a conference call, so 
technology is not a problem. You just phone in. And so please join us on the 17th. A churchwide Advent study begins soon. The books are out in the foyer. Uh, donations of $10 is asked if you are, are able. If not, please, uh, it, please take a book anyway. Go ahead. And we welcome our new elect bishop, Connie Mitchell Shelton, to, our, to the North Carolina Conference. New Creation Mission Committee thanks everyone for signs, signing up and reminds you to bring your purchased food to the church no later than Sunday, November 20th. Prayers are requested for Catrius L. Bronley, the McFall family, Prayers for our annual conference to be held on November 19th. And condolences to Rufus and Rhonda on the loss of Rhonda's mother, Miss Mitchell Powell. Sympathy for Plummer and Mary Jones, the loss of their cousin, Clarence Wilkerson. Condolences to the Glover family and the loss of Wilford Glover, cousin of Lee Livingston. Continued prayers for all the people on our prayer list. And we lift up to our birthdays today. Uh, Alice Jones on November 15th, Abby Lopez November 18th, Marissa McDonald November 19th. Happy birthday. Please stand for the call of worship. The Lord continually creates something new. Through all this change, God is with us. Praise be to God who continually blesses us. Amen. Out in prayer, Lord of light and life, we come to you this day in celebration of, of the witness of your Son, Jesus Christ. Open our hearts, our spirits, and our lives to listen to his word for us. Help us to be fulfilled and help us to be faithful disciples for you. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be sitting.
Good morning, church. When we last celebrated Men's Day in 2019, we noted that we had not lost a member of our fellowship during the previous year. This year, however, we light a candle today in memory of four fallen brothers, David Allen Eustace, John Hill, James O. Gibbs, and Gregory Carter, who joined with those United Methodist Men of Reconciliation, Asbury Temple, and New Creation, who have gone on before. The names of all our deceased members are listed on the board. They're also in the bulletin. These are men who have lived their lives in service to their community, their church, and their God. They provided examples of lives well lived. A life well lived is a precious gift of hope and strength and grace from someone who has made our world a brighter, better place is filled with moments sweet and sad, with smiles and sometimes tears, with friendships formed and good times shared, and laughter through the years. A life well lived is a legacy of joy and pride and pleasure, a living, lasting memory our grateful hearts will treasure. Rest in peace, thy good and faithful servants. Well done. Every year we nominate a man of the year, a man that stands out for service and commitment. This year's nominee has been a committee member of the church and stalwart in his ministry, volunteering in many areas. He is on the trustees and hospitality committees at the church. He ushers and volunteers for special projects. We often see him up in the choir also singing. He is part of the group that researched and found us a new stove. And he goes beyond that. He's uh, active in the community beyond the walls of the church. He has been active in the Rotary International for over 30 years. He founded World Help International to supply a low-cost water purification system to areas suffering from natural disaster for unsafe water supplies. And he continues to use his engineering skills to find innovative ways to fill unmet needs around the world. Our current project is designed, designing <clears throat> interlocking lightweight bricks that can be cheaply manufactured using recycled plastic and local sand. Now I'm told also that he, uh, he's an enth enthusiastic square dancer at the local Durham Dance Club. A man of the year this year is Harvey Selma. Prayer of Illumination. <clears throat> Prepare our hearts, O God, to accept your word. Silence us in any voices but your own. And also do it through Christ our Lord. Amen. The first lesson is from Isaiah, verses, uh, chapter 12, verses 1 to 6. 
In that day you will say, O Lord, I will praise you, although you were angry with me. Your anger has turned away, and you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he also has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the springs of salvation, and on that day you will say, Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make his works known among the peoples, declare that his name is exalted, sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known in all the earth. Cry out and sing, O citizens of Zion, for great among you is the Holy One of Israel. Good morning, church. Good morning. Uh, the gospel will be coming from the book of Luke today, uh, chapter 21, verses 5 through 19. I see everyone is already standing. Thank you. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, he said, As for these things you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. And they asked him, Teacher, when will this be, and what would be the sign that this is about to take place? And he said, Beware that you are not led astray, for many would come in my name and say, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified. For the things must take place, for these things must take place first, but the end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, Nations will rise against nations, kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and in various places there will be famines and plagues. And there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. Make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words of wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair on your head will perish. Endurance will gain your souls. A word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. What an honor to present our speaker for today, Bishop Dr. Kenneth Monroe began his life and ministry in a small town of Red Springs, North Carolina. He was baptized and became a member of the St. James African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church of Red Springs and was later called to preach at the early age of 17. He received both the deacon and elder ordination by Bishop W.L. Hillard in 1972 and 1974, respectively. Upon his completion of his undergraduate studies at Livingston College and receiving a Bachelor's of Art degree in Social Studies, he entered Duke University Divinity School. In December 1976, he graduated from Duke with a Master's of Divinity degree. In October 2003, he received a Doctorate of Ministry degree from Harvard Seminar, Hartford, Connecticut. Bishop Moore served various congregations in North Carolina, Kansas City, Missouri, and Hartford, Connecticut. 
He has served at the presiding elder of the Kansas City District, which includes congressional congregations in Kansas City, Missouri, Kansas City, Kansas, Des Moines, Iowa, and Omaha, Nebraska. From 2001 to 2004, he served as presiding elder at the Nassau District of Bahama, Bahamas Island Annual Conference. In July 2004, he was elected the 95th Bishop of the AME Zion Church. He was assigned the Western West African Episcopal District, which included the countries of Ghana, Togo, Liberia, and Coto de, de Lavore, the Ivory Coast. In December 2005, he was given the responsibility to supervise the Kentucky and Missouri annual conferences. In 2006, he completed the construction of Janney Speaks Hospital, a Franco, say, a Francia, Ghana. Thank you. In October 2006, he was able to dedicate the Allen Janney Speaks Hospital in a Francia, Ghana, with support from the WHO M Society. From 2008 to 2016, he served as the presiding bishop of the South Atlantic Episcopal District, the AME Zion Church, PD, Pamela, Palmetto, South Carolina, and Georgia Annual Conferences. In December 2012, he was assigned the Central North Carolina and Virginia Island Annual Conference. In October 2004, he completed the construction of the Kenneth Monroe, Monroe Trans, Transform, Transformation Center, Rock Hill, South Carolina. He currently serves as the presiding bishop of the Eastern North Carolina Episcopal District, inclusive of the Central North Carolina, Cape Fear, North Carolina, Albemarle, and Virginia Island Annual Conferences. In June of 2022, following the death of Bishop Millard, Mildred B. Hines, he was assigned the South, Africa, South Atlantic Episcopal District for the second time. He serves as chair of the Board of Trustees at Livingston College, Salisbury, North Carolina, chair of the Board of Trustees at Clinton College, Rock Hill, South Carolina, chair of the Board of Global Missions, and chair of the Board of School of Colleges. He serves as a member of the Pan Methodist Commission and a member of the World Methodist Council. He is a member of the Board of Directors of the National Conference of Black Churches in America. He is also a life member of the NAACP. He is author of a book entitled Adventures of Uncertainty, Making the Impossible Possible with God. All the proceeds from the sale of the book goes into the Impossible Made Possible Scholarship Foundation that was created in 2018 to support pastors attending seminar. And personally, he is the third son of the late Paul and Hazel Monroe of Red Springs, North Carolina. He has been married to the former Sheila Wells since May 24th, 1975. They are parents of three children, Erica Green of Rayton, Missouri, Kevin of Kansas City, Missouri, and Adria N. Monroe of Overland Parks, Kansas. And they have eight grandchildren. He strives to live by the theme he has embraced as a, <clears throat> as a means of inspiration and motivation for more than 30 years, make the impossible possible with God. After a song, the next person you will hear speak is, is our speaker for today. Thank you.
First, express my appreciation to Pastor Livingston for extended invitation to speak to you this morning. 
and to this uh, men's choir, known as, I like to consider them as the new creation singers. <laughs> I'm grateful to God for the opportunity to stand before you because I just finished the annual conference yesterday afternoon in South Carolina and I'm grateful because I'm reminded of my roots in the United Methodist Church and the Amy Zion Church. My grandfather was a minister in the United Methodist Church, or the old Methodist, ch uh, Methodist Church, central jurisdiction. My father and grandmother and uncles and all were part of the United Methodist Church, and I Perhaps you think I was uh, strayed away, <laughs> but my mother was A.M.E. Zion. I solicit your prayers this morning after reviewing your theme. I was somewhat perplexed when I looked at that theme and it says, men making the world a safer and better place to live. I wrestled with that until 2.30 this morning. And I got up and have another message. I need you to think with me and I apologize for not having this text and message to you earlier. But from the book of Second Kings, chapter 7, verses 3 and 4, we find these words. Now there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate. They said to each other, why stay here until we die? We say we will go into the city. The famine is there, and we will die. And if we stay here, we will die. So let's go over to the camp of the Amnians and surrender. I mean, and they spared us. If they spare us, we will live. If they kill us, then we die. For a few minutes, I need you to think with me from this subject, from problems to possibilities. You know, most times we have a problem. When, when we do have a problem, we do not know the answer or we do not accept or believe the answer to the problems given to us. Unfortunately, a great deal of us are having problems because either we do not know the answer or we have refused to accept the answer to our problems. Our society is complete with free thinkers and people who are very opinionated. Our society It's complex. And the call of God to the church to do miracles or even to do the impossible has been impeded by or because of opinionated, cantankerous, or even contrary people. Believe it or not, there are people of the church who do not believe in miracles or even in one another. Moreover, there are people of the church who have not learned how to demonstrate faith in God. 
Please note when the people of the church fail to believe in God or even the word of God, we have a significant problem. Suffice it to say, there are those of us who would rather bypass having faith in each other and just trust God. Of course, even such thinking indicates that there is a problem. Perhaps having faith in God or even the word of God has become old-fashioned or out of date. To believe what God promised or even what the word of God says over what seems reasonable to us or what technology or the economy or even what medical science predicts seemingly is spiritually unhealthy. My brothers and sisters, why should I believe that the Lord will make a way and I cannot see how a way can be made? Why should I believe in miracles and all I ever seen is troubles and trials and tribulations and difficulty? Destruction and disaster, pain, poverty, problems of every kind. Why should I trust God when I've never heard him or even seen him or experienced him in my life? I've noticed him in the church because the people of God are struggling. I have not noticed him in the community because there is much confusion and strife in the city. Even when I heard God's name, it is called in vain, but it is expressed in a profane way. Why are our problems so loud that God seems to be so silent? Or does he really hear the cries of his people? When I think about such reasoning, has anyone seen or has anyone heard from God lately? Of course, it's difficult to trust the invisible or even the unknown. Unfortunately, we have embraced a sight religion. We can only believe because we can see it. The faith of our fathers and mothers that brought us to where we are today has become, in many instances, dormant. In many instances, we have ceased to make, a, make progress because we are unable to see our way. We have stopped moving because we are unable to see our way. We have learned to depend on the successes of the world to shape our destination. We will follow fortune rather than faith. We will seek convenience rather than employ commitment. Yet we are unable to understand why we find ourselves with so many problems. Nevertheless, problems will always be about us. If it's not about the problems we experience, it is knowing how to employ the right answer to our problems. A story is told of a man sitting before an open window on the fourth floor of a hotel downtown New York City. It was a busy hour of the day and the traffic was roaring on the street below with horns blowing and policemen whistling. It was so busy, it seemed dangerous. Every person on the street was danger, in danger. One thoughtless moment, one second lapse would interrupt a person's life with a crash. A child dashing from behind a car, a blowout, failing brakes, and a hundred other hazards would put a life in jeopardy. But suddenly, the man looks and captures the sight of a man, a pedestrian. His eyes were shielded by dark glasses, and his left hand firmly gripped the harness on the shoulder of a German shepherd. The man is blind but he has two eyes and ears better than his own to aid him. The dog is of the seeing-eyed variety. 
carefully trained to take his master safely through the busy traffic. It's amazing to watch the calmness of the dog. If his tongue hanging, he is very, he is the very picture of composure. He's not excited. He does not wait for a chance to dash across the street between the cars. Without a sign of nervousness, he leads his master to the curb and stops. He waits with eyes and ears at attention. When all is clear, he quietly and safely guides the man across the street. They pass out of sight without harm or fear. This man is safer than anyone else in the street because he walks by faith. When we exercise faith, we're able to see God more clearly. Think with me, could this be the cause of many of our problems? From a quick review of our lesson found in 2 Kings chapter 7, we find four lepers trying to deal with the problem facing them and how they might survive. But our question, the problem that are facing them have not given them much or any hope. These men have been excluded from the community because of their disease. They're infectious and only allowed to move about in colonies to warn people of their disease. Time and time again, a family member or friend are allowed to get word to them that there is food or supplies for them, but that has stopped because of the famine in that city. There was no hope for them in the city because of the famine, and many of the residents of the city have turned huh, to can cannibalism. There are problems in every hand without a sense of hope for survival. Even the thought of surrendering to the enemy was suggested, but such a thought had grave or deadly presumptions. In the midst of their <clears throat> deliberations, one of the four leprous men thought, why shall we sit here until we die? We say we will enter the city, then the famine is there, and we shall die there, and if we sit still here, we will die also. Now therefore come and let us fall into the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we will live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. My brothers and sisters, I'm not sure why God brought me to this lesson in 2 Kings. Perhaps there's an answer to our problems in this text. These men have found themselves in a hopeless and helpless condition as it appears. And as we review the lesson, it appears that there is no outside help for them to go and find relief. There's nothing around them that seems to be getting any better. Sounds familiar? Mm -hmm. These lepers are dying. The people in the city are dying. And the only possible relief might be found in their enemy. Yet before anything is done or anything is decided, these four men, leprous men, begin to examine their situation. Why sit we here until we die? The problem might be in the place. The problem might be where we are. You know, I'm not sure which one of the Four lepers thought it important to examine their situation. While sitting at the entrance of the gate of the city, I'm sure they were hungry, they were tired, they were hopeless and frustrated. Rather than they just sit there hopelessly, 
They decided to do something rather than just die without trying to live. There was no one to bring them ointment or salve to put on their diseased bodies. There was no one to bring them food or water to strengthen their bodies. There was no Red Cross, no FEMA, no home mission fund, no benevolent fund, no Salvation Army, no social services, no stimulus package. Actually, there was nothing productive about just sitting there. You know, if we would examine our situation as individuals or as a congregation, sometimes we would discover that all our human resources are limited, ineffective, or just have run out. In most cases, when our resources have been depleted, the only thing that, we will, that will save us is a miracle. Of course, if we do not believe in miracles, <laughs> we really got a problem. Moreover, walking by faith is, is, is a journey toward the miraculous. When we walk by faith, we do not depend only on our material, our tangible resources. When we understand that our resources are not only material and tangible, but our resources can have eternal and far-reaching qualities, then we are able, then we'll know that we are able or on our way to experience a miracle. And it's important for us to understand that we cannot stay in the same place and overcome our problems. We cannot do what we've always done, go where we've always been, and do what we've always done and resolve our problems. Yeah. We, have had, we have had the same thoughts, the same ideas, and the same problems for years, on top of years with no resolve because our thinking and our location have all been the same. Wow. We are praying with no answers from God, perhaps because our position with God is so far away from him. It appears that we do not have any influence on the people or the situations we are involved. Is it possible that we cannot connect with God where we are standing or where we are sitting or how we are thinking or even in the place we are occupying? We cannot connect to God. We cannot hear God. We cannot communicate with God or even with one another in the place or the position we are currently occupying. If we've been there too long. Many times, it will require miracles to get us to change our situation or even our location because nothing has been done to change our views. Nothing has been done to change our thinking. Nothing has been done to change our ways. There hasn't been a shift. Perhaps we're still in first gear. And we're straining. Please don't get it twisted. Miracles are designed to bring glory to God. As individuals, as a congregation, or a gathered people of God, we are designed to bring glory to God. When a miracle occurs, it's not designed to just benefit us or just get us out of our mess, but to glorify God and expand the kingdom. Amen. Our situations are in grave condition, and it will require a miracle to turn us around. However, 
It's important for us to understand that God will not create a miracle for us to remain the same or to do what we've always done. Why, why would God do that? <laughs> it's possibly necessary for us to examine our situation and ask the question, have you, ever, have you any rivers that seems uncrossable? And have you any mountains that you cannot tunnel through? But God specializes things that seem impossible and he will do what no other power can do. Yeah. Y'all listening, aren't you? Yeah. But then secondly, as we move from problems to possibilities, it's important for us to eliminate our shame. Mm. Our shame is our failure to acknowledge the truth about our situation or to acknowledge our wrong or our disobedience or our misguided opinion that have either created our problems or have been the cause of our situation to get worse. As it relates to these lepers, there's nothing noted in the text that pinpointed the cause of their problem. However, it is important to note that they were willing to surrender their end to their enemy or who they thought was their enemy to defy their death. Hmm. You know, whenever we surrender, it's an act that indicates submission. Most of the time, we are not willing to surrender whether we acknowledge the fact we are right or wrong. It's almost a miracle to declare that we are wrong. You know, there's some people. If they say I'm wrong, that's a miracle. Some people never do that. Listen, our numbers are dropping. There is no new members or disciples connected to our congregations. The morale of the spirit of our congregation sometimes is so low. Our influence with the membership in the community is almost gone. Yet we make statements like we're growing in faith. <laughs> but actually, there is no evidence of our faith. Most of the membership is almost gone, but we still insist that things are going well. Help me, somebody. Amen. Our congregation that dwindled down to the size of a Sunday school class. <laughs> Yet, we seem to have difficulty admitting that we are in trouble or that we have a problem. Mm. It's imperative that we must eliminate our shame. Mm. It would be difficult for me to forget my last day in the hospital in order to assure my recovery, I was placed in intensive care. Everything I would normally do for myself was taken away, and I had to surrender myself to the medical professions. I was not allowed to get out of the bed for anything. Y'all listening? All my shame was eliminated in order to achieve the restoration of my health, my strength, my resources, my pride, as well as those things which we deem private were canceled and unable to, un unavailable to me in order to achieve my recovery of my restoration. I was totally dependent on another source for care for hygiene, healing, and restoration. It was important for me to eliminate my shame. For some reason, our preaching has not been as effective and our teaching has been inadequate. Oh. Face it, we have a problem. And we're struggling to maintain our purpose in ministry. Face it, 
we got a problem because we cannot continue at the pace we have been operating. Face it, our numbers are failing. Face it, our influence is almost non-existent. Face it, we need some help. Face it, our faith has not been active or employed in years. North Carolina Conference, we are in trouble. AME Zion Church, we are in trouble. Household of faith, community of believers, men of God, district superintendent, bishop, we are in trouble. Yet I am confident that God will see us through. <laughs> if we but trust him and eliminate our shame. Oh, I like you listening. Listen, a college freshman went to the dorm laundry room with his dirty clothes bundled into an old sweatshirt. Think, think about it. He was so embarrassed and ashamed of his dirty clothes that he never opened the bundle. He merely put the bundle in the washing machine. And when the washing machine stopped, pushed the bundle into a dryer and finally took the still unopened bundle back to his room. He discovered, of course, that his clothes had gotten wet and dry, but not clean. <laughs> if, we are so, if we are to eliminate our shame, we must open up our shortcomings, open up our failures, open up our inadequacies and be true to ourselves and true to the God we serve. Are y'all still with me? Good. But then finally, if we are to move from problems to possibilities, we must embrace and employ a new standard. The lepers in our story were ex excluded from the citizens of the city. Don't have question, they, they were diseased and infectious. They were not permitted to enter the city even though the city was in the midst of a famine. The lepers were dying as well as the citizens of the city were dying and neither was able to console or support each other. I'm not aware of any sin or wrong that was done by the lepers that would eliminate them from the society. They were just diseased. You know, you kept us out of the church for a long time because of COVID-19. As I review the conditions of our society, you have become indifferent and prejudiced against people who are not like us or even think the way we do. There are people who have thoughts and ways that causes me to be very uncomfortable around them. There are young people who do not think or present themselves in ways that I can appreciate. We're surrounded by all kinds of races, ethnic groups, national nationalities, and other groups that are foreign to us. Yet they, like us, yearn to be loved and respect it. Of course, there are some standards all of us must embrace and employ to connect to Jesus. Jesus stated in St. Luke, if any person, man or woman, come after me, let them deny themselves, take up the cross, follow me. For whosoever will save his life will lose it. For whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same 
shall find it. Without question, there are possibilities all around us. But we have eliminated so many people because of our standards. For years, we cast our nets for fish. But if they did not suit our fancy, we threw them back. Unfortunately, we have treated our congregations as if they were clubs and lodges or organizations that only allow certain people to join who met our standards. We have created the wrong kind of criteria for membership. We have looked for people who look like us, dress like us, give more than we give, do what we want them to do, and agrees with our definition of salvation. Please understand me, we have a problem. If we continue to embrace and employ our understanding of church, the possibilities for growth will be limited or non-existent. Hmm. I'm reminded of a story of a man who found himself in the midst of a very serious problem. He had nothing for his family to eat. Upon searching throughout the house, he discovered that he had an old shotgun and only three bullet shells. So he decided that he would go and, and kill something for his family to eat. As he went down the road, he saw a rabbit. And he shot at the rabbit and missed it. Then he saw a squirrel, fired a shot at the squirrel, and missed it. As he went further, he saw a wild turkey in the tree, and he had one bullet left. But a voice came to him and said, pray first, aim high, and stay focused. However, at the same time, he saw a deer, which was a better kill. He brought the gun down and aimed at the deer, but then he saw a rattlesnake between his legs. So he naturally brought the gun down further to shoot the rattlesnake. Still the voice said to him, pray first. Aim high and stay focused. So the man decided to listen to the voice. He prayed, then aimed the gun high up in the tree and shot the wild turkey. The bullet bounced off the turkey, killed the deer. The handle off the gun hit the rattlesnake in the head and killed it. <laughs> when the gun had gone off, it knocked the man in the pond. When he stood up to look around, he had fish in all his pockets, <laughs> a dead deer and turkey to eat. <clears throat> the snake was de dead simply because the man listened in the midst of his most difficult problem. You know, as we seek to find solution to make the world a safe and better place to live, Examine our positions. Eliminate our shame and embrace and employ new standards. Our Lord is awaiting for us to join with him in the midst and in the ministry of reconciliation and transformation. It would be to our advantage to pray the prayer, I need your glory. I want your glory. Less of me and more of you is what I need. Show me your glory. Show me your power. Less of me and more of you is what I need. Sometimes I stray away rejecting your love and warm embrace. But I come to realize 
I need you more and more and more each day. Solving problems and making possibilities. Amen. Amen. was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. where we share our joys and our concerns in Christian fellowship. James 5.16 says that we need to confess our faults one to another and pray for another, that ye may be healed and that the effectual prayer of a righteous man avail it much. Uh, Gene, will you handle they are might. We can share at this time con joys and concerns. Are there any joys? No joys this morning? That's highly unusual. Okay, Stan and Jean will bring the uh, mic to you. Thank you. Other joys or concerns? Um, yes, um, I have. So I have. Um, I have many joys. Um, one of one of my concerns is I learned yesterday um, my, my cousins lost their aunt. Her name was Carol Cheston. Um, so pray for the Cheston family. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank those who have signed up to bring food for our Giffen's family's Thanksgiving boxes. We still need some valiant person to pick up the three turkeys. The uh, Good Samaritan Fund is handling the cost of those, but we do need someone who will shop and bring them to the church. Looking forward to hearing from the volunteer. Thank you. Any other joys or concerns this morning? My mother's brother, Carl Davis, uh, he's been uh, ill for a while, been in a rehab center, but his heart stopped uh, a couple days ago, and uh, they revived him 
but he's in Duke right now. He's on a ventilator, so we all saw him yesterday, so it's not looking that good. So prayers for my mother and her family, the Davis family. Okay. Any other joys or concerns? If not, pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, we give you the honor, the praise, and the glory. And thankfulness for this worship service today, for the celebration of the United Methodist Men of New Creation United Methodist Church. We thank you for the work, Father God, that they are doing in the fulfillment of their mission. We give thanks unto you, Father God, for the power of the message that was spoken this morning by Reverend Dr. Bishop Kenneth Moore. We thank you, Father God, for the pathway, problems to possibilities, the importance of walking by faith, and trusting our hope in our almighty God. We thank you, Father God, for understanding that we need to open ourselves up to our shame. We need to adopt new standards, <coughs> excuse me, in pursuing our faithful walk, hope, and trust in the resolution of all problems through our Heavenly Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father God, this morning for all that you have done, doing, and yet to do. We give thanks unto you, Father God, for the joys for those who are celebrating birthdays. We thank you, Father God, for the service of our military veterans and especially, Father God, for those who made the supreme sacrifice. Father God, for the concerns that were spoken as well as those that were unspoken. The power of intercessory prayer, Father God, will prevail and avail it much. We know that all things, Father God, will be done according to your will, in your timing, and in your way. So I pray, Father God, that you open up our hearts, our minds, our souls, and our spirit to accept and to understand through faith that all things are possible. Father God, we acknowledge this morning, Father God, that we all need to be uplifted. We all need to be strengthened. We all need to understand the importance of faith in our life. But in concluding this prayer, let us remember from the message that we need to pray first, we need to aim high, and we need to stay focused. These and all other petitions, Father God, we render in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the body of Christ shall say amen. You know, we cannot even presume to approach this table trusting in our own righteousness. But we can trust in God and his manifold and great mercies. We are spiritual lepers, not even worthy to start to gather up the crumbs underneath this table. But there is a God that we can trust in. He invites us to this table through his son, Jesus Christ. So let us confess our sins before him. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. 
free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, and that proves God's love for us. And so, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. As a forgiven and reconciled people, let us turn to our neighbors and extend the peace of Christ to them. Let us prepare to offer our lives, our gifts, and our offerings to the Lord our God. If the ushers would please come forward.
indeed we would praise your name, glorifying it both now and forevermore. Accept these gifts that come from us. Receive them through your Son, Jesus Christ, and use them for your glory and the expansion of your kingdom. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Indeed, it is a good, right, and just thing to always and everywhere give thanks to you, Almighty God. You are the creator of all things, shaping heaven and earth. You even shaped us, taking the dust from the earth and breathing into us the breath of life. And whenever our love has failed, your love has remained steadfast as you showed yourself to be our covenant God. And so with your people on earth and the entire company of heaven, we would praise your name and join their unending hymn as we say together, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Truly holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Before you spoke in a variety of ways, but now in the fullness of time you have spoken through your Son, the Word of God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. When we could not see our way forward, you sent your Son to be the light of the world, to illuminate for us the path of salvation. We remember how on the night when he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. When he had given thanks to you, Almighty God, he broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after the supper, our Lord Jesus Christ took the cup and again he gave thanks to you, Almighty God. Then he offered the cup to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Lord, we pray, we petition you to pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes again and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. With the confidence that we have as the children of God, let us pray as our Savior has taught us. Our Father, in your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who sin against us, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Friends, take up the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, take and eat, and see that the Lord is good.
us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. It's our final act of worship. Let us stand and petition the Lord to stand by us. the peace of God that sustains us and the love of God that embraces us and the power of God that enables us ever remain with us in our going out and in our coming back now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.